It's a, a pleasure to be here, and um, I, uh, I usually start this sort of moment in the, in the, in the day by asking people to uh, sort of take their mobiles out of their pocket and turn them back on again. Um, I guess given the number of competitors stroke operators here, we might be, I might be disappointed by the number of different handsets that come out. But um, <coughs> what I thought I'd do today is, is really share with you something a little different in terms of what's happening beyond the, the sort of the shores of the UK and how that's going to have a very direct impact on what's, what, how we manage our digital business uh, going forward. Um, those of you who don't know me, um, I, uh, I started Nokia about three and a half years ago, having previously worked for T-Mobile. Um, I ran the UK business for, for the last three years, and the beginning of this year started running the, the, some of the global uh, retail and operator marketing uh, teams around Nokia. Um, but interesting, 20 years ago, I first visited India and Southeast Asia in a gap year, year as a student, and I was fascinated by the, the, the change in culture that you experience in those, those individual markets. Now, I regularly visit those countries. Uh, last week, I was in, in, in India, and next, next week, I'm in China. And there's a massive revolution going on there. Different companies operate and market in diverse ways in these countries. Uh, the change happening in these development, developing markets means that digital is everything in this world. They have really leapt over traditional media in the way they access um, the, the content online. And I know we have a very interesting panel discussion later on changes in digital marketing, and I thought this might be some food for thought in terms of what we do there. You know, we live in a world of smartphones, be it iPhones, Nokias, Blackberries, and that can make us lose sight of what the vast majority of consumers are actually experiencing, both here and abroad. Um, and I'm going to talk about the next billion mobile users, yes, next billion uh, mobile users, and the changes that such a change in that population will have on the way that we, on the internet, and, how, and its rapid expansion. Firstly, where the next billion uh, users going to come from? Um, well, coined over the 10 years ago, the BRICS concept, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, the coming countries, or next generation countries, have been confirmed most recently by Rio's triumph in the, uh, in the Olympics bid. Anyone that's been to Sao Paulo, Mumbai, or Bombay will have noticed these are no longer third generation countries. <coughs> They're really first generation developed markets. Um, the next billion mobile consumers will consist mainly of rural poor, both in these five countries, but also some surprising new countries too. We often see two or three levels of development in, the, in this area, urban, near urban, and rural. And in any given emerging market, it is a large part the rural and near, urban, near rural connections that are going to propel growth going forward. Mobile operators, a number of which are in this room, are taking very innovative approaches to connecting these rural consumers through village-wide mobile phone programs, you know, sponsoring individuals in the, in the village to own a mobile phone, trading phones for cows or, or, or for, for livestock in terms of a way of supplying them, um, and ultra-low charges for, for prepay phones. None of this focus is new, but it's useful to remember that new telephone connections in these, in these areas have significantly out, out uh, uh, outperformed the, the connections in upper and middle tier countries. And in fact, going forward, almost all new mobile connections in the world will come from these countries. The, 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 the churn in existing developed markets will not see very many new uh, subscribers added. And it's not just connecting people with devices. These are people with mobile landlines. So no longer constrained by voice alone, these countries are actually leapfrogging landline technology. They'll fly over the fixed wire internet and they're hungry for information and for a portal onto this new world. Landlines get dug up in many of these countries. They don't exist. It's much cheaper to put a base station in than it is to actually physically string out a wire of copper along the, uh, the highway. In our own experience, we've seen a huge take up of new services in these developing markets. We launched our OV mail service in Bangladesh and Indonesia and have seen massive, massive growth of people wanting to connect to mail through their mobile device. If I take China, for instance, our Mobi portal in China receives over 100 million hits a month disproportionate level to the absolute population that sits in that country. So people are accessing through their phones far more than they are through any traditional, um, as we would consider traditional, uh, ways of accessing the web. The sheer speed of adoption and email and messaging is astonishing and reflects a genuine hunger for thirst for connection. Those of you who might have watched or seen the BBC's current Hunger to Learn series gives, a seri it gives an insight into this pre-developed world. I was personally struck by the girl in West Bengal who was earning three pounds a month as a salary. And if she was lucky, she was able to get an hour of, 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 of part-time education <coughs> during that month. So this is, you know, this is a really typical example of people in this area. 
We all think we're familiar with this. We think we know the stories of individual hardship that we bundle under the words emerging or developing. But a day of foraging or tra traveling to a menial job where the hours are almost limitless and leaving no leisure time is a real struggle for survival. A combination of low pay, long hours, low levels of educational provision and no leisure is, is, a, is a situation that real hobble, really hobbles human potential and stunts economic development. It's approximately what Europe could have said to have been in the 17th century, yet there's a television down the street. Yet it's these people who are doing more to change the way that mobile and digital will evolve over the next forthcoming decade. Some experts see that this will actually see significant growth for everybody having a mobile within five years in these countries. Five years, that's a very short period of time for another billion people to be accessing uh, and, and developing content for the web. So something to we need to ponder is, you know, what effect will that have on them and what, will have, what effect will it have back on us? Interestingly, the, the we need to be starting to know what effect it will have on them. Um, let me start taking you through a journey through, through, through people's lives in some of these areas. Um, I, I'm going to go through a number of areas to, to talk about this, but uh, mobility and digital are making profound changes on people in these areas, and they're really changing their outlook on life and how they act, interact with it. Um, I was in India um, last, well, I was, in, I'm Indian, I was in India last week, but about six months ago I spent some time in India, and I spent time out with consumers in the market, talking to them about their, their attitude and approach to, to life and to, to mobility and to you know, what they were looking for. And the real trade-off there is not, not the trade-off about whether they, you know, what they buy, it's about whether they actually purchase a refrigerator or a mobile phone. You know, that sort of trade-off, which is actually three months, four months salary, is an enormous challenge. Yet the mobile phone is providing significant income to them as a result of what it can do. And uh, there's, there's evidence that suggests that you know, for every 10, 10 mobile phone users per 100% um, of the population, that you'll grow GDP by 0.8%. That's a phenomenal figure in terms of their access it provides to information technology. But for 10 years, research has now been doing fieldwork that's trying to evaluate this, this change. And I'm going to talk you through a couple of examples. So first to Corella. Um, here, this, this little town on the, on the coast here, <coughs> fishermen typically went to, to sea to catch fish. Um, they went out to the sea. There were a number of markets that traded fish along the coast of this, about 15 kilometer coastline. Um, typically, they could only land as much fish as they caught in that day, and they had to make a predetermined choice about which port they went to when they landed. The port had no infrastructure. You couldn't transport product from that port. So whatever they landed was whatever they sold and then determined the price. But as mobile technology advanced down the coast, I think uh, by virtue of Vodafone colleagues here, um, it meant that they had, um, they had access to market pricing in a number of different villages. So they could choose which village they came into. What happened is fish could then, the, the, the actual fish was no longer thrown away. It could be utilized. The prices that the, the, the individuals received went up. They made, started making more profit. But the prices the consumers received started going down. So all in all, the complete model worked for everybody in the chain. And this development of mobility in this space leapfrogged anything they would have had previously. You know, it didn't exist when we were developing that technology in the 17th, 18th century. So suddenly they've leapfrogged this area. Of course, now there's an app for that in that area too. So um, let me take you to a slightly different place in, in uh, Niger. Um, in Niger, a similar situation exists. In the in, in middle, middle of the country, uh, markets where they were selling and creating, you know, farmers having grain to sell to a market town. They had no idea how they were going to get a price for that grain. They had to turn up, they had to pack their, um, their transport, whatever that might be, and drive to a location or, or actually uh, take transport, be it um, horses to that location. They didn't know what price they were going to get paid until they arrived there. By the time they got there, they had no other choice <coughs> to go anywhere else because the cost would have been prohibited. Access to mobility and to a mobile system of information allowed them to then choose which market town they went to, it meant that they could be more efficient in their transactions. It meant the price of grain went down, their profit went up. And again, it <coughs> leapfrogged that technology. So two examples of where economic well-being and, 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 and that took people from subsistence to a very different level, paying for the technology that allowed them to support that. And this has really led researchers to conclude that mobiles are fundamental in a leapfrogging uh, development tool, caping, capable of taking economic development to a totally different level in a very rapid space of time. 
And no, this represents people using technology in a way that suits them and empowers them. Um, and something we might well do to remember in the UK, that this is really the consumer push to the nth degree. Um, but it's not just the economic model that's being impacted by the mobile. Um, we do some work in Maharashtra with um, uh, what we call a progress project. We work with Lonely Planet here, um, and it encompasses an array of Nokia initiatives that use technology to help improve the quality of life in, peop in people in emerging markets. Uh, it empowers <coughs> folk globally uh, with valuable and often life-changing information tools. It really changes their lives, in, and it provides uh, important contextualized information on a daily basis. And I'll, I'll come back to this importance of providing contextual information at relevant points in time in, in, a, in a consumer's life. Um, and it does it in a way of a minimum, simple, uh, no-fuss way. So I'm just going to show you a short video that uh, relates to that. <coughs> decisions every day based on the information we have at our disposal, from weather forecasts to stock market updates. But some parts of society have access to more information than others. I've come to a market in the agricultural heartland of Western India, where farmers are facing an uphill battle to get the information they need to make a living. Dr. Toshliwal, nice how are you? I'm Francis, how are you? Nice to meet you. Dr. Toshliwal of the local agricultural marketing board represents the farming community in the state of Maharashtra. So what are the main problems facing farmers? We produce very high agricultural produce, good quality agricultural produce, but we are not getting good prices. The farmer is uh, living in his village. He is not aware of what market prices will be today because information is not available to them. That is their problem. To find a solution to this dilemma, farmers in Maharashtra have been using a mobile information service called Nokia Life Tools. Jawahar. Nokia's Jawahar Kanjilal is taking me to meet a farmer who has been testing the service for the past four months. Farmers had two distinct problems. The information that's coming to them was not necessarily customized to them for their location, for their crops. Second, information that is intended for them uh, did not necessarily reach to them at the right moment. So Nokia Life Tools tries to bridge this information divide in their lives. In the small village of Barshi, crop farmer Tatadere Bonge now uses his mobile phone to get information on crop advice and market prices. So Tatadere, can you explain to me how you use the agricultural service in your day-to-day -day life? And what is your favorite feature about the agricultural service? For farmers like the Tatri, it's clear that this agricultural service makes a lot of sense. But I'm off now to meet another local family who are using Nokia Life Tools for an entirely different purpose, to learn to speak English. Mahesh Shetty has lived all his life in Maharashtra and works at the local bank. His education has been entirely in the local Marathi language, but with the banking industry going online, a grasp of English is a valuable asset. Mahesh's children, Aipurva and Sama, eagerly await their father's return from work so that they can practice their language skills on his mobile phone. Sentences are delivered to the handset in both the Marathi and English language, helping the children to increase their English vocabulary. Aipurva, how do you use Nokia Life Tools to learn English? Can you read this? 
not waiting to keep so much cash at home i went to the bank to deposit it <laughs> These kids are definitely their father's children, and English learning is clearly an affair for all the Shetty family. For the vast majority of Indians who live in rural areas such as this, it's the arrival of 21st century services such as Nokia Life Tools that's enabling them to take control of their lives, to close the information gap, and above all, claim their share of India's economic boom. So I use that really just to illustrate how this amazing change in the digital content that's available online and the access through mobility will shape lives. It's shaping lives rapidly. And this is not just a one-off example. This is happening everywhere in China, in India, in parts of Somalia or Indonesia and Malaysia. It's a massive role out of this. And, and both ourselves and our host Google, with, through the Google Foundation, are doing a lot of work in this area to bring this um, leapfrogging technology to individuals. Um, but what is key is, the one, the simplicity of the service, and two, the contextual nature of that. And I think that's some of the learnings that we can take back into, into, the, into our business in the UK. Um, but it goes further. So let me take you somewhere else, uh, uh, Amazonia. Um, this is more about actual fully about life expectancy and health itself being impacted in remote areas where there are no PCs. There's no access to a, a, a normal fixed line ne network. Here, um, uh, an example involving dengue disease in the Amazon of Brazil. It's one of the biggest killers in many, many developing markets. And I want to show you what we're doing here to try and help in this area. As a travel writer, I'm acutely aware of how technology is shrinking the world. But try telling that to someone in the middle of the Amazon jungle, the largest and most impenetrable rainforest on Earth. I've come to Manaus the capital of the Amazonas state in northern Brazil, where the local health department is using mobile phones to help fight the spread of dengue fever. In such a remote environment, the rapid relay of information can mean the difference between life and death. Dengue affects more than half a million Brazilians every year. I'm on my way to meet Lucia Mustafa at the Dengue Control Center to learn about the threat of the disease. Dengue é uma doença, né, infecciosa aguda, né, que é transmitida pelo mosquito chamado Aedes aegypti. Se não for tratado, pode morrer. Se não chegar a tempo ao posto de saúde, ao hospital, pode morrer. Local mother Maria Pinto has seen at first hand the suffering caused by the disease. Porque o sintoma dela é muito forte, é muita dor de cabeça, é muita dor no corpo, febre, é frio. <laughs> Você, my name, my is, name is Emily. Fala. Uhum. A minha filha também, ela teve a dengue. Ela teve logo primeiro do que eu. Muito, né? Com muita dor no corpo. Ela não conseguia andar. Ela ficou afastada da escola. Ficou de licença da escola também. Uns 20 dias ela ficou de sangramento no nariz. Ela estava dormindo. A hemorragia ela dá sim. To see how mobile phones are being used to fight the disease, I'm heading to a village on the outskirts of Manaus with local health worker Tanya Xavier. O bairro que nós vamos visitar, o vila, o local onde nós vamos, ele é de característica mais rural. With a remit covering one and a half million square kilometers of rainforest, the sheer scale of the dengue control program in Manaus is quite simply mind-boggling. To help field workers like Tanya do their job, Nokia has developed a data gathering technology which enables the control program to build a profile of communities most at risk from the disease. I'm joining Tanya on a house call to Pura Quequara resident, Maria da Costa. Tanya is just showing Maria exactly what a mosquito larva looks like, so that if Maria should find it anywhere around the compound or in the house, she knows what it is. After testing any areas of concern, Tanya uses the phone to input details of any mosquito larvae presence. Tagged with the GPS coordinates of the location, this information is transmitted instantly back to the lab in Manaus. From this, authorities can quickly identify dengue breeding grounds and take action to eradicate the threat of the disease. Before health workers like Tanya had access to this kind of technology, the information they collected in the field could take months to reach the lab. Nokia Brazil has been supporting the development of this new technology. 
by knowing where uh, uh, the, the disease is being spread, of course, that makes the authorities more capable of targeting uh, specific actions to those areas that are affected. It helps organizations to collect uh, information faster and more accurately. To find out what kind of impact this technology is having, I'm meeting Rosemary Pinto, an epidemiologist who specializes in combating outbreaks of dengue fever. In 2007 2008, we had 3,522 cases in Manaus. With the help of the technology, in 2008 2009, this number reduced to 245 cases. Então a gente já tem conhecimento, assim, mais, porque antes dava mais nas pessoas, por isso que as pessoas não tinham conhecimento como se cuidar, aí dava, que agora graças a Deus esse tempo tem, tem parado, a gente não tem quase visto falado tanto quanto dava antes. O que realmente me chocou sobre essa tecnologia é como um device simples que é usado para coletar e compartilhar informações pode ter um impacto na vida da comunidade. I think you got the long version there, actually, rather than the short one, so my apologies. But I think the important thing here is that um, what I'm trying to bring out is the fact that the location element of this is a really fundamental piece in terms of how that technology is enabling. Without location, without being contextualised and timely, information is nothing. So for us as marketeers, the importance of actually providing information that's relevant and meaningful to the individual in the location or at the right time is an incredibly powerful tool. And I'll talk a little bit more about how Nokia is enabling that going forward. Um, you know, we're used to thinking of digital marketing in HD with sophisticated flash banners and apps. We've seen several examples of connections and difference on a huge scale with a very back-to-basic approach. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from that. The success of Twitter in, 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 the, in the developed world has been a function of simplicity and ease of use. And uh, it's, it's interesting how SMS has really fundamentally shaped some of the way we manage our marketing principles. You know, we can, in many markets, harness SMS in a very different way to how we're doing it now. And it's proved to be one of the most flexible and solid tech tools we've had at our disposables that's almost universally understood. So for vast populations, the SMS medium is the message. It genuinely connects people with information in new ways. And we've seen many examples in other parts of the world where collating and consolidating SMS message, both inwards and outwards to an organization, has really reshaped the agenda in those markets. And I take examples in Nigeria, for instance, during the voting, and Kenya during, during some of the political unrest there, where organizations have been able to capture information through SMS and consolidate it and then feed it back out to those individuals. Um, so, you know, I think a couple of messages that, 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 that resonate for me here is simplicity of message, contextual information, location focus, all the big learnings that are happening in these markets and through the, the simple, because they, have, they don't have the technology and because they don't have the financial resources, they simplify the message to the consumer. And sometimes we could be best trying to work to a much lower budget on things to make sure that our messages are much simpler, but often elaborate them in a, in a very um, theatrical way. So as I said, everyone will have a mobile device soon, perhaps in the next five years. Um, that puts it somewhere between four and five billion mobile devices around the planet. The next step is the internet, which for most of the next billion will experience on either a mobile or fixed, uh, non-fixed device. The internet will help create even more opportunities to make positive change in this space. And the type of device which will emerge as the majority of the world's first internet device will inevitably be the mobile phone, because that's the, the device and the, the, the medium they have at the moment. The portable internet has been a massive spur to innovation in the developed world, and think just how impactful that will be with another billion users there. So let's imagine the world of mobility that's just around the corner, where there is no migration to online because everything starts online. Financial services, shopping for non-essentials, entertainment and news not delivered by the state. And this is a real driver for many of these markets, getting free information, information that's not uh, censored by a number of the, the, the political bodies. So who are going to be the people who set up these services? The evidence so far is that, that local content is absolutely key here. Uh, when it comes to many of these. And as we're seeing, we're talking about a swath of the world population where the only marketing environment will ha will, they will have had been online, where social network for the time being has been bypassed and where instant messaging is, is absolutely key. Lower and lower prices will mean the next billion users will transfer money without ever seeing a bank, will watch a film without ever going to a cinema, 
I might listen to music without ever attending a gig, and potentially vote without visiting a polling station. It's a big change in terms of where we've had the, the benefit and luxury of growing through this change rather than suddenly being confronted with it. And as I've indicated in a circular way, I believe we're in the developed world, we'll learn from these markets within the next five years. So what does it mean for us? Well, uh, an example from, from our business. We um, recently announced a, a business called Nokia Money, um, a <laughs> partnership with OboPay to create this, this entity. Um, and whilst the original intent of this was to drive micropayments in third world countries to alleviate the, the complexity of carrying money um, where security is, is, a, is a big challenge, we're seeing huge growth in some of our North American markets for this sort of application. So this transfer back from payment methods and, 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 and products that have been developed in the, in, the, in the developing world will soon infiltrate our own marketplaces. I guess the question for this audience is how will digital marketing, for instance, work where there's been no pre-existing online environment? It's the first sort of marketing they see. It's not an extension of, of the marketing that we traditionally know, but it is the marketing medium that exists out there. So it's, I guess in many companies, and I know we, we reflect on this a lot in Nokia, it's not the starting point for your media creation online. It happens to be something that happens in the process of the media creation. What if it's the start? Because that really changes the way that you market in the media marketing space. So I started a, a, with a word about me, and I'd like to conclude with a word about you. Um, you know, we are lucky to work in industries, we do, but sometimes it's good to broaden our focus and lift ourselves from the day to day. I mean, I, I'd encourage any of you, if you haven't traveled to some of these markets, it is hugely insightful to see the change and development there that's happening, and there's a lot that can be learned. If you have subsidiaries or other parts of the business there, do take the opportunity to learn what's going on there. We typically plan in quarters, live by half years, but life is on a much bigger scale than that. We can and should only apply skills to big prospects and dreams. But among other issues we might start addressing are how will business models work in markets where value is currently lower? Will the sort of free model that we've existed on in the, in, in the developed markets work in where, where the average income is, is substantially lower, where a mobile device might cost three months' salary? Can you sustain the infrastructure? Will our advertisers pay that level of uh, investment to maintain online? <coughs> will it mean the free model as internet spreads? What is true, though, is this mobile and digital revolution will accelerate marketing from the deference state it has been to a reference state. It's a well-documented thing. I'm sure people will talk about that later on. But as conversational marketing becomes increasingly important, think what impact that next billion people could have on your earned media values. So another billion people contributing to the reviews, to the tweets, to whatever it might be about your brand is a significant impact on what could happen. A staggering impact on brand values. So a clear strategy on earned, owned and bought media is critical for us and should be critical for you too. But we also apply that to what we call our people and places approach. So this is about, as I mentioned earlier, providing contextual data that can ex enrich the experience of using the web. So knowing where the people are we connect with is inherently useful and extremely powerful to us as marketeers. Most of our devices and most devices are coming, new devices coming to the market will have GPS chips enabled in that device. And through either logarithmic uh, working out through the cell site, people will know roughly where you are or exactly where you are. And the ability to access and present information to individuals in that sense is hugely powerful and will change the way we market digitally to a huge, vast array of population. Um, the next generation of mobile users will reverse new thinking to our markets and develop new and completely different web, e web ecosystems. And I think this is going to be a really big area for future competition in the whole ICT space. You know, there are currently 300 million active Facebook users, but we're talking here about the next billion mobile users. Um, and I see you know, the, the data is just staggering in terms of the speed of adoption of these users. If I combine India and China together, there's something like 100 million users a, a year coming on. So we as marketers have a huge opportunity to leverage the, the intimacy and personal nature of the mobile experience. There are very, very few things you don't take around, take around with you everywhere or drive home to go and get because you've left at home. That's a very intimate experience. So we need to make sure we protect it, uh, make sure it's secure, but keep it relevant, simple. And I believe all of us can grow through that as we go forward. So finally, um, <coughs> I believe that the world's rural populations will lead the way in effective deployment of new innovative digital technologies because I think they are starting there first. 
And whilst it might not be there now, I think if you look what's happening in China, we will learn an awful lot of what they're doing on the online space uh, in the short and, and certainly the medium term. To me, this is a convergence on a scale we never expected to see, bringing more change to more people than we could ever have dreamed possible. It is now possible to begin to speak of humanity really converging around uh, uh, some very powerful life changes that we are in the position <coughs> to be able to shape. And that's an exciting um, and, and, and very um, opportunistic uh, area to look at. So I've tried to give you an example of where I think we are heading and, and try to perhaps change the state of reference from what you traditionally see up here. But I guess we've got a little bit of time now, so I thought it might be useful to open the floor to some questions. Um, either about this or about other stuff that we at Nokia are doing. Um, but given we're announcing our results in about an hour and a half time, I probably won't be answering anything about that. <laughs> so, some, some questions. Well, I think um, the, there are two, two areas I take. Nokia Life Tools, which is a, um, a very simple uh, tool that allows uh, contextual information to farmers about uh, market pricing and everything, is has, has suddenly taken off faster than we ever imagined. And the, the ability to use that application to provide very simple data to people in a meaningful way where they subscribe to the service uh, has recognised that we think there's a lot more opportunity for us. And though we might not bridge into t fully developed markets, we're certainly now looking at how we extend that into uh, you know, second-tier countries in terms of that, that application. On the financial services piece, the oboe pay, as I mentioned, <coughs> piece, that micro-payments element that we've developed for emerging markets because of the, the lack of infrastructure around banking and security around banking, I think will definitely kind of migrate its way into the, um, the, the, the uh, developed markets. We're already seeing that grow. You, know, you only need to have PayPal that's developed online as an example of that. But this ability to access and pay for on your mobile device. Um, and as near field communication grows, the ability um, to those of you who use Oyster cards will be very familiar with that technology. That integration to mobile phones will also shape and change the way that we make payments too. Because you'll have access to, you can, you can pre program the near field communication to allow you to access. <coughs> and I think a number of people in the room might be doing trials of that at the moment. I'm totally worried from there. Um, do you see the, the tools that you're developing at Nokia as marketing efforts or business development efforts, or are they now one and the same? Um, the best part to start is they start as commercial efforts, and I kind of link the two together. They are business development tools that are now becoming marketing tools, and, and I guess this leads on to the sense of that this is um, your, your ability to communicate to the consumers through your own media formats, so unpaid for media, is a very, very powerful tool that I think people have underestimated the value of that. So the touch point you have through the, the home screen of your phone is actually a form of marketing to that consumer. And the way that you build that and extend that through the communication process you have through to those of you who use my Nokia, the tips or tips that have come back is a very, very powerful tool. And I think we certainly now are looking at that, how we, we extend that reach in a much more significant way. We're, we're working on some, some concepts about advertising equivalent value. So how do, you, how, do you how do you look at the total value you could advertise to your consumers? Through your bought media, which is clearly very traditional in many respects, through your uh, earned media, through conversations you have online, through mobile, et cetera, and through, through the, the um, through your, own, through your own media that you have in your store base, for instance, and your own portals and stuff. So having those three elements of kind of is, is how you can look at the total uh, impact you have on the consumer. It also means you need to get, by the way, get your touch point strategy right. So where do you touch consumers in their journey and their life cycle and making sure you understand what their needs are at any, at any given point during that journey. I just wondered what you saw the, the trade-off between mobile apps and, and direct access to the internet was in the future. Um, I actually don't see it as being a trade-off. I think mobile apps will um, typically provide a streamlined access to the cloud and to, advocate, to, to information within that web. The apps will help to consolidate that information. There is a school of thought that says that you, where, does the, where does the data reside? Um, now, depending on the, 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 the bandwidth you have available to you, um, and typically if it's mobile, you are always somewhat constrained by bandwidth, despite the, the, the increasing technologies. 
you do really want to have some data that resides on the, on the device so that actually the speed can be much faster and the experience can be much better. You don't want to be sitting, you know, consumers have a very short lifespan, so they don't want to be waiting ages for stuff to download to be able to get that. So if you can combine access on data, and I think this is, our, this is very much our strategy on maps, is that you, know, you, you reside a, a core function of data on the device, and then you use relatively low transmission bandwidth to bring in new information into, into the application that you're trying to use. So I think it's a combination of two, um, but I think it's the important thing, and, and Apple in Fenton has shown a great example of this, is that you, the simplicity of the interface is what drives it. Many of the stuff that was available on Apple iPhone has been available on smartphones for years, but it's actually how you bring that to the consumer and make it usable. I think most people only use 10% of their smartphone applications. So how do you make sure it's concentrated and visible and easy to use? Um, I think we are, um, the screen size and the visibility <coughs> of uh, information is, is clearly vital to consumers in terms of those of you who use a, you know, those of you I'm sure use a mobile and use a laptop, there are very few people who can get away with using the screen size of a small mobile device. Um, the netbook um, phenomenon has, has really changed that. One would argue whether that's about price or whether it's about screen size in terms of portability. Um, so, you know, if you look ahead, there are loads and loads of development opportunities that are, that are happening here, from probably the, the far out there, which is projectors built into phones, which do exist and they exist now, but you can live with about 30 minutes of battery life, which is kind of not great if you want to make a call, um, to dual screening screens, to flexible screens, but the constraint is around the visible viewing area. Um, and whilst I think some people will say, well, actually, why don't you get glasses and all this sort of stuff, and there, there are those applications that exist, the reality is you want a screen that's usable, but you also want it to go in your pocket. So they're the two designing strengths. It needs to fit in your pocket um, or your handbag, um, but it also needs to be visible. So that's the challenge that our designers and many other manufacturers designers are working at, how do you drive the most usability of that? Um, so that, that is the, the critical thing. There is, I think what is important is there is only one internet though. You know, 10 years ago, there was a view that Mobi would be kind of a, a different internet, but consumers don't want that. They want the internet on their, in their device. And so you know, that's the challenge that we have to work around to make sure we use that. And there's lots of innovation. You, know, you, you do use the internet site differently when you're in a mobile environment. So therefore, you're probably less casual in the way you browse it. You're actually specifically looking for information. So the important thing is how do we contextualize it to what you're doing, where you're looking, and then bring just the relevant information to us. And I guess that's a challenge for the the, the web engineers as much as it is for us as well, is that how do you make that relevant content come to the front and not the, the spurious content running outside, which does bring challenges to it, kind of a, an ecosystem that's built around advertising in some of those areas. So, you know, it's, there's lots of opportunities in that as well. <coughs> so, yeah, first here Yeah, I mean, it's, it's early days at the moment yet, but it's, um, you know, we clearly recognize the need for very low transactional payments in consumers. Um, and those transactional payments clearly are lower in developing markets just by the nature of the, the, the GDP in that market. Um, what is interesting is, though, that you also have quite a big need in developed markets for some of those transactions, transactions that are perhaps some, some pound where the cost of paying through traditional banking channels is, is prohibitive to allow that to happen. And so if you can create the right infrastructure, um, and this is very complex because it's linked into all the banking regulations that exist in different countries, so it's not a simple one, but yeah, it's probably not everywhere. It varies country by country. But where you've got the infrastructure, you've got the flexibility of it all for that, we think this is a unique uh, opportunity for payment by either buying services online or buying services you know, in a traditional bricks and mortar type environment. So it is a, I think it's a fundamental opportunity that's going to exist. It won't just be us. A number of the operators looking at this. I think Vodafone in, in, um, in yeah, I think it's Kenya, have a huge system which is, is it involves massive, so I think something like 7 million consumers in, 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 in Kenya are using micropayments through uh, Safari conferences and small subsidiary Vodafone. So it exists out there already. It's not new, but it's, um, I think in terms of doing it on a global scale, that's what's 
Another question about Vodafone. Um, I'm just wondering, in the past, people were not buying more mobile phones without actually touching them and feeling how they work. Uh, now, with the emergence of e-commerce, I was wondering what is the importance of the online channel for Nokia, both in um, both in emerging markets and in developed markets. Okay, so the question was the the importance of online uh, in, in Nokia in terms of both emerging and uh, developed markets. Um, I think we have to we have to be about online is a you know, huge opportunity and you have to be in that space. Um, it's a difficult one when you get into device purchases though. It's a bit like those of you who've been in the fashion industry or something. People struggle a little bit where they buy something that's very important, something that's physical, that, that they don't have a clear understanding of. So whilst if you know the device and you're, and, and you're a tech leader, you know exactly and you're buying something on specification, then you buy it. But a lot of people, it's such an emotional experience buying a mobile phone um, as it is in buying clothes or something. If I asked the women here who, how many would buy a handbag, or buy, unless they'd seen it somewhere else, they might struggle to say that they've done that. So th there is a sense of we still need to be able to offer and showcase the device in a way that's physical, so they can feel it, feel it emotionally touch it, feel the weight of something like that. But once it's established and people know what they want to go, they also want to be able to access it online. So we have to do a combination of both in that sense. In the developing markets, um, it's very different because the infrastructure doesn't exist online at the moment to be able to access those portals. So in those markets for us, it is all about the distribution network. You know, we probably have the biggest global distribution network um, in the world for a fast moving consumer goods. So, you know, we access parts of the world everywhere to get the products out there. Um, and that's, that's a very key asset of ours in terms of being able to sell to consumers directly. But as we migrate these people online, then online is really going to be a big part of it. You know, there's a big push for us internally as well, digital as part of our, our business strategy. <laughs> Simon, thank you very much indeed for setting the theme for today, so very eloquent.